Next on AM 1480 WLEA, the Newsmaker Show. Here's Ryan O'Neill. And uh, we missed you last week, uh, Dr. Nick Waddy. You were, uh, you were, I believe, at some important meeting in uh, Brussels. <laughs> you could say that. <laughs> I did visit the European Parliament, uh, tried to show them the error of their ways. I'm not sure it worked, though. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. I wanted to uh, start out with uh, an interesting point that Rush Limbaugh made recently. They just give the talking points out to members of Congress and they run with it. The media gets the talking points. Committee chairman and these uh, House committees, Democrats, I get the talking points. Everything's coordinated. Everybody's saying the same thing. So no matter what soundbite you use, everybody is talking about Trump the same way. And they haven't the slightest idea whether it's true or not. That's an interesting point that uh, Limbaugh brought up there. And Rush, uh, on his show on a regular basis, uh, plays examples of that. But I didn't have any of those uh, handy, and I did have some from Tucker Carlson on Fox News. We have a president who believes he is above the law. The American people do not want a president who believes that he is above the law. In the United States of America, no one is above the law. For an American president who has no respect for the rule of law? No one is above the law. Uh, what I will say is that no one ought to be above the law. No one is above the law, not even the president of the United States. Well, I think, in a way, what Rush Limbaugh is accusing the Democrats of is, is smart politics. They're coordinated, uh, which they need to be. And truthfully, in politics, the truth or falsehood of your claims doesn't matter nearly as much as the sheer repetition of them. Uh, if you control the message, if you control the conversation, and you have the media supporting your narrative, if you simply repeat a claim about President Trump enough, um, many people will believe it. Unfortunately, probably most people will believe it. What I've seen lately is that the claim that's being made over and over again in the media is that President Trump is racist or that something he said is racist or his tweet was racist. Um, and that's just another line of attack that they will use consistently. And unfortunately, it will work on impressionable people. And there are many of them. Any thoughts on the uh, Baltimore controversy with oh, uh, Congressman Elijah Cummings and President Trump? Absolutely. Yeah. I, I think it's another example of President Trump saying things that are true, uh, but which Democrats don't want to hear. And their canned response to everything they don't want to hear is that you're a racist or you're a sexist or you're a bigot of some kind. Um, and again, this will work on some people. It, it really shocks me to see allegedly objective news stories in the press say that President Trump is racist or that President Trump's tweet was racist. There's nothing explicitly racist about anything he said. He criticized a member of, okay. he criticized a member of Congress uh, for launching what he considered to be smears against uh, federal law enforcement, the, the Border Patrol. And, you know, he's the President of the United States, and when someone uh, makes unwarranted and uh, unreasonable attacks against uh, federal law enforcement, um, he punches back. That's, that's what he does. It's not racist to criticize someone of color, but it is racist to refuse to criticize someone of color when you believe they're wrong. And he's not going to do that. Uh, on the Twitter thing, it's been said pretty consistently since Trump got into office that he tweets too much. Do you agree with that? No, I don't, because uh, his tweets are a way for him to influence the news cycle, uh, a very powerful way for him to do that. They're a way for him to connect with his supporters. I think he has around 60 million Twitter followers um, frankly, if every single one of his Twitter followers were to vote for him, that in itself might win him an election. So that's a, that's a very powerful tool of communication. But the other thing that he's doing with these tweets is he's, he's baiting the left very successfully. You know, he's built some of these uh, Twitter wars into conflicts between him and the squad, and that works very well for Republicans. The squad is is way out there on the left, and the more America pays attention to the squad, the better it is for the Republican Party. Re just recently, he got into a spat with Al Sharpton, 
that's wonderful. We we want Al Sharpton to be the face of the Democratic Party. So um, there are certainly risks in his strategy, and he does at times tweet things and say things which could perhaps be tweeted or said better. Um, but nonetheless, I think, uh, you know, he's a bit of a provocateur. That's just who he is. He's not going to stop tweeting, and there is an upside to his tweets. Dr. Wadi, uh, Vice President, former Vice President Democrat uh, Joe Biden holds uh, big leads. Uh, there was a, uh, a poll that came out, uh, I believe it came out uh, yesterday, it has him uh, 33% of likely Democrat voters will vote for Joe Biden. That's 13 points ahead of uh, Bernie Sanders, who plays second with uh, 20% uh, support. Elizabeth Warren comes in uh, third in the survey at uh, 14%. Any thoughts on those numbers? Those numbers are supported by a whole bunch of other polls that have come out in recent days. They're all showing more or less the same thing. But those are national polls, and I think what will be more important will be the the, uh, the results in Iowa and New Hampshire, because those will set the tone for the race. And in Iowa and New Hampshire, the evidence is that Biden is ahead, but he's ahead much more narrowly. And potentially, someone like Elizabeth Warren could be second instead of Bernie Sanders. So I think those polls might overstate Biden's strength to some degree nationally, and almost certainly overstate the strength of Sanders. So... There's still a long time to go, but um, Biden uh, was not significantly harmed by uh, his debate performance in the first debate. We'll see what happens in the second debate. That's going to be fascinating. You know, who's going to attack who? I I think some of these Democratic candidates further down, um, someone like Harris maybe, but definitely someone like O'Rourke or Buttigieg, they should be starting to feel a little bit desperate. Uh, they're getting left behind, and if they don't start swinging punches pretty hard in this debate coming up this week, uh, they could be left behind for good. Talking to Alfred State European history professor Dr. Nick Wadi, and speaking of Europe, which is where Dr. Wadi was last week, and actually the week before too, uh, Dr. Wadi, what are they saying in Europe about the, uh, and you were with some uh, British people, what uh, what are you hearing about the election of uh, Boris Johnson? Well, uh, actually, my latest article is about Boris Johnson and giving him some some advice on how he can shepherd Britain uh, through Brexit, which is not going to be easy. But so far, so good for Boris Johnson. I, I think probably most Britons don't like him, but that doesn't matter because it's a multi-party system. And uh, the truth is the Conservative Party has seen its support in the polls go up since he was uh, named prime minister. And there's a lot of support for Brexit. So if he can rally everyone who supports Brexit to his side, um, he can be popular and he can potentially win a snap election if that becomes necessary. But, you know, Parliament is um, very skeptical of Brexit. It's exceptionally skeptical of a no-deal Brexit. So He's gonna he's be he's gonna be playing a very dangerous game over the next few months, and uh, things could go badly, and and his uh, prime ministership could be short, uh, which is what a lot of people expect. So, this is gonna be a huge test um, of his leadership, and I believe he can pass it. Is uh, Europe getting how do I say it? Trumpized these days? Do you think, Doctor Wadi? Well. You could mean a variety of things by that, but if you mean that it's getting polarized and the politics are getting more personal and more bitter, yes, I think that is happening. I I was talking with someone in in the Netherlands about this, and I think the United States is sort of on the leading edge of this trend. You know, I've used this word before, but I think our politics is just getting more asinine and more juvenile and more personal. Um... And none of, none of that bodes well for the future of American democracy, but it's happening in Europe, too. Um, uh, but I think that uh, they're a little bit behind the curve in that respect. So, uh, But, yeah, I, I think to some degree you see that in the reaction to Boris Johnson. Boris Johnson, uh, some Britons see as a Trump-like figure, and they have developed uh, 
a disgust uh, with Boris Johnson that is rather similar to Trump derangement syndrome. So yeah, you see some of the same things happening in Europe uh, that are happening here. Dr. Wadi, moving into uh, this day in history. We covered all the current event uh, topics you wanted to uh, uh, touch upon, Dr. Wadi. Uh, so far, so good. Yeah, I think so. I mean, there, there's so much happening in the news. It's hard to know where to start and where to end. <laughs> yeah, let's get into uh, this day in history. Unfortunately, today's day in history doesn't have a whole lot. Let's do yesterday's uh uh, day in history. On this day in uh, 1965, well, I should say yesterday in 1965, LBJ, President Lyndon Baines Johnson, signs Medicare into law. Did you have any thoughts there, Dr. Wadi? Oh, yes, Brian. I have a lot of thoughts. Um, I understand that Medicare is a popular program and many Americans depend on it for health care. And Medicare is not necessarily a bad thing, but it does bring with it some troubling aspects. And that is, first of all, a massive expansion of government. Government, because of Medicare and Medicaid, uh, was able to take over about half of, half of our healthcare system. And because it controls about half the funding for the healthcare system, in effect, government now can give orders to doctors and nurses and hospitals and insurance companies and it really runs the show and among the effects of that has been an enormous rise in the cost of health care you know we've been accustomed to health care costs rising two three four times the rate of inflation and government's involvement is a big part of that so um, eventually uh, the cost of medicare and medicaid could break the bank could cause uh, uh, a real financial fiscal crisis for our government. Um, we, we are in some ways getting closer and closer to that every year. Um, so, of course, the other thing that Medicare and Medicaid did is it provided a precedent as far as the left is concerned for a government takeover of the whole of medical care. There are now Democrats who are saying we need Medicare for all, which means to some of them at least, we need socialized medicine for everyone. We need to get rid of private medical insurance. Could that actually happen? Um, it's difficult to see the present Congress passing it, but um, uh, you know, never say never. Now another this day in history, and we covered these yesterday with uh, Dr. Gary Ostrauer. We're doing yesterday's history because there wasn't a whole lot on today's day in history, but it was a big day for Watergate. We talked about that uh, pretty extensively yesterday with uh, Dr. Gary Ostrauer. And uh, the Watergate tapes, some of them came out uh, in this day in history, in 19, yesterday's day in history, excuse me again, 1974. Dr. Wadi, do you ever go back and listen to the Watergate tapes? I've done that uh, quite a bit, actually. I can't say I've listened to them from start to finish, but I've checked out the Watergate tapes. Nixon does not come out looking uh, too well in that. Now, you're a Nixon guy, more or less, I would say. Um, your thoughts, Dr. Wadi? Well, I guess my main thought would be that uh, if any of us put a recording device in their office or in their home and was recorded 24 hours a day in every conversation with everyone. Um, I suspect if our conversations were selectively edited, uh, we would end up looking like awful human beings. And That's, then you uh, add to that, he had a lot of stress on him, and then too, and I'm not picking on him on this one, uh, Nixon did have... A drinking situation going on at the time so you know you, you add all that together dr wadi and uh yeah it's it's a, it's a complicated mess the watergate tapes yeah for sure um you know there there's so many aspects to watergate there's so many um uh, th uh crimes and uh ethical lapses of which president nixon and his administration was accused that you know, it's difficult to analyze, but on the basic question of whether President Nixon obstructed the investigation into the Watergate break-in or tried to obstruct the investigation into the Watergate break-in, that's a complicated issue. And he would, he would have said himself and did say for the rest of his life that um, looking only at that one conversation on a, on a tape in the White House, and I think it was June 1972, 
is is um, you know taking the whole thing out of context, and that um, at the end of the day he supported the FBI in its investigation into the Watergate break-in. So um, I think President Nixon made a grave error in installing those those. Uh, recording devices in the in the White House and and if it were not for that I think he probably would have survived in, in as president have you ever heard any of the other presidents you can go you can hear them uh, uh, I'm sure in numerous places but YouTube you can go and hear oh things like uh, JFK uh, peeling out his press secretary you and <laughs> swearing at him two or three times you can hear uh, President Kennedy uh, talking to uh, the governor of California, both of them picking on Nixon. You can hear uh, President, you can hear Bobby Kennedy uh, talking to uh, Lyndon Johnson and J. Edgar Hoover about the way uh, uh, the uh, uh, Dealey Plaza assassination investigation was handled. There's all kinds of stuff up there. Uh, have you ever checked out any other presidents besides Nixon as far as audio recordings go? No, I can't say. Even with respect to Nixon, I'm not sure I've ever heard the, the Watergate tapes. I've seen transcripts. I've read transcripts, but I'm not sure I've ever heard them. That would be an interesting experience. But, you know, I think... Um, Nixon's overall reaction to Watergate was was that he believed that mistakes were made and that that elements of his administration, including himself, um, made mistakes. But he believed, as as you're sort of alluding to, that President Kennedy and President Johnson were guilty of the same kind of dirty politics and and possibly worse. But what happened in Watergate was that President Nixon was targeted by the Washington establishment and the media in a way that uh, President Kennedy and President Johnson never were. So, so in a sense, he was held to a different standard. You know, I, I wanted to jump in on that. Dr. Ostrow and I have had conversations about uh, who's, who's uh, uh, worse in terms of, uh, in terms of political uh, techniques, Nixon or uh, Trump. Uh, I've, told Dr. Ostrow, and he wrote an editorial about this disagreeing with me, uh, but I've told Dr. Ostrow, I think that history proves, uh, so far anyway, history, you know, the history books aren't written on uh, President Donald Trump, and he may be uh, in for a second term, but uh, so far it looks like the dirty political tricks that were played in the uh, uh, late 60s and early 70s in the Nixon administration were worse. Uh, Dr. Wadi, do you think that the liberal media is effective when they keep talking about Nixon? Uh, do you think that they're losing people who are younger? And I'm talking about the press, the liberal press. When they talk about Nixon all the time, aren't they kind of committing the same mistake that all the conservatives do when they talk endlessly about Chappaquiddick? I mean, you're talking to some people who remember it, but that's mostly uh, senior citizens. Are they missing some generations uh, because of their uh, topic? I think they undoubtedly are, Brian, but what one thing you have to understand about your typical middle-aged uh, liberal is that uh, he or she is stuck in a time warp. Uh, they see everything in the context of the 1960s and the 1970s. So every Republican they don't like is like Nixon, and every war is like Vietnam, and every Republican policy is like segregation uh, or like opposition to the civil rights movement. Those are the, their touchstones, and so they they constantly go back to that well. And uh, it's a context that they understand, but you're right, probably young people are a little befuddled by some of these references, and a lot of the references are clearly very weak. Trump is not Nixon, and, uh, you know, some of the things that went on in the Nixon White House, whether or not he knew about them, were clearly criminal. You're, we're talking about break-ins and, and wiretaps, and, and none of that has happened under the Trump administration, and, and he hasn't even been accused of most of those things. But where I will um, suggest that those kind of dirty tr tricks uh, were um, pursued is under the Obama administration, because the effort to surveil the Trump administration, the effort to pin a false charge of Russia collusion on the Trump campaign, 
is rather similar to the dirty politics that happened in the 60s and, and the 70s. And, you know, we thought we had uh, moved beyond that in America. And unfortunately, the Obama administration proved us wrong. You know, you talked a moment ago, Dr. Wadi, about uh, the, the liberal, uh, the average middle-aged liberal is stuck in the 60s and 70s. Okay, let's, let's, I, I wanted to uh, bring up the, the topic of Nixon and Kennedy, if we could. Um, President Nixon, I remember being uh, in a class, uh, it was a science class in college, and I had a left-wing professor who said, uh, he was a big Nixon fan, and and this was in the 1980s, and there were some, not gasps from the class, but some puzzled faces. And the uh, professor said, no, Nixon was great for the environment. On the other hand, you've got uh, JFK, who, uh, and I'm reading from Time Magazine here, uh, while he increased military spending, overall he restrained the federal government. His plan for economic growth emphasized not deficits but tax rate cuts that he argued would eventually pay for themselves. He uh, reduced tariffs and took a hard line against communism abroad and home. They're arguing that uh, Kennedy was a conservative in many ways that people don't know about. I think you could make the argument for Nixon in the same way. Not to argue that Kennedy was 100% conservative or that Nixon was 100% liberal, but they do have those sides to them, both of them. Yeah, well, certainly the legacy of Nixon is, is a lot more complicated than many people understand. The truth is that politics in the 60s and 70s was different than it is today, and the modern conservative movement didn't exist in the 1960s and 70s, or it was just beginning under Barry Goldwater. Um the truth is that government expanded dramatically in the 1960s and in the early 1970s. And um, pre bo both the Democratic and the Republican parties were relatively comfortable with the expansion of government in those days. And President Nixon, you know, he won a re-election in 1972 by a huge margin. And part of the way he did that is he got a lot of Democratic support and he got a lot of Democratic support by spending a lot of money and by adopting many uh, liberal or at least centrist positions on uh, important issues. So yeah, President Nixon was not uh, a straight down the line, uh, modern style conservative, not by a long, not, not by a long shot. So um, I would agree as, as for President Kennedy being a conservative, well, uh, on certain issues, you could say that, but um, I think he uh, was also part of this long-term trend of expanding governmental authority. So um, in that sense, I, I would peg him as a liberal. Dr. Wadi, we are out of time, uh, but uh, I want to thank you as always for joining us. Thank you, Brian.